Municipal Building 301 North Stagecoach, Slato, Texas, September 19, 2019, 6.30 p.m. This is a call to order. Secretary, please call the roll. Here. 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 And we have another person sitting up here with us. Michael, would you do us the honor of telling about her? Well, Your Honor, there's been a tradition that we have a representative of the student council attend these meetings. And I think this one is going to actually raise the IQ of our full board by about 20 points, I think. But I'd like to introduce Avery Hyatt. Uh, she is a senior at Salado High School. She is uh, on track to be valedictorian, which puts her in, if I figured this right, puts her in the top 100 in the class. <laughs> and uh, she also is a head chair, and she has some obligations, so she missed the first uh, meeting that uh, we had planned for her to attend. And we recognize that uh, our students uh, have uh, lives outside of uh, doing things like this. But this is Avery Pyatt, in that we welcome her to the board. Well, welcome. This will be an experience that you will live the rest of your life. You'll see people and hear people, and you'll hear all kinds of things. Don't let it jade you. Just keep, keep going strong. And when it's all said and done, I don't know if a valedictorian can get into the Naval Academy, but we would see, and we'd try to get you in here with that. It's good to have you, Avery. All right. Let us bow our heads for prayer. There is nothing like the loudness of silence. When you slow down in a day's work and contemplate a lot of different things, we've got major decisions to be made tonight. We need clear thinking, good understanding, and we need to be able to express ourselves in a way that would be suitable to you and to our neighbors and friends. May we be able to disagree and agree to still be friends. Let us be able to walk through this path tonight and when it's all said and done, to give you thanks for the many things and blessings that you have given us. Open our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts, and give us strength. Be with those in our community who are sick, those who have lost a loved one, and those who have gone through difficult times. May they, in some special way, know that they are being remembered tonight. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Let us stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Texas flag, please. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and individual. Thank you. You may be seated, please. All, um, we're going to call Cox Hall in a second. Um, may the minutes reflect that Amber is here. But we have a full, a full board. Paul, uh, 
Do you want to speak now or do you want to speak when the subject comes up? Uh, I, I just didn't speak now. Okay. Then let me give you, and this is going to be for the rest of the evening uh, and for the other ones because most of these are going to be speaking on the golf course. So let me just say to you, this is a very, very precious time that you have to come and speak. You're speaking to us. We will make the decision and we will not take, well, we'll take notes, but we will not ask questions. You have three minutes. Mike Hagen keeps the time for us and he has a little beeper on there that will go off. Give your name and give your address, and then the minute stop starts. So, Paul, it's your turn. Paul Cox, two seven one six Winter Circle Drive, Insulado. Uh, I want to speak briefly on the golf course. I was at the Tuesday meeting. Uh, where we had, I think, almost 90 people. Is that right? 87 or 8 or something like that. Uh, that we talked about the golf course. There were some views that they didn't want any changes, mainly because of you know, evidently riding grandkids on public streets is some people's priority. Uh, and the fact is that you know, you as aldermen are really here to protect the welfare and the safety of all citizens and not your personal views on, on what you want to do with your grandchild. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other people. In fact, uh, there, was a, there was a show of hands on how many people want to change to the way our ordinance is written. Uh, and by my count, it was at least 70%. Uh, by others, it was higher than that. Uh, that won't change. And that's a that's a big majority. So please, you know, you're elected to present all present present represent all of us, and we need s something more specific in our ordinances. Uh, this is just one example, and it, and it's an important one right now. We're growing too fast not to do something. And I know uh, Frank and I were talking the other day about. Uh, the new bills and, and how that's going to change and I think it's more specific which is good but we need it delineated in our ordinance so people can read it and understand it without having to go through two or three other places for to find out a law you know and our and our streets uh, you know it's fun to be with grandkids but our streets are, are not a ride at Six Flags you, you don't take your golf cart out to, to entertain your four-year-old kid on a golf cart, especially when it's between your, standing between your legs. Uh, that's just not reasonable sense in my opinion. And I would appreciate you considering at least looking at this and rewriting it. I'm, I'm, I don't want banned golf carts. I don't want seat belts on golf carts. I don't want, you know, any of that. Uh, but there's no other place that I've read in, anywhere in the state that allows night driving at all. And we let anybody drive anywhere they want to after dark. I mean, it's incredibly dangerous. But anyway, uh, let's do something at least, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Number two is consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion for the following. Number A, approval of minutes of the regular Board of Aldermen meeting on September 5th, 2019. On the back of the page, B, approval of minutes of the Special Board of Alderman Meeting Executive Session of August 29th, 2019. C, approval of minutes of the Special Board of Alderman Meeting of September the 12th, 2019. D, approval of minutes of the Special Board of Alderman Meeting Workshop with the Planning and Zoning Commission on August 29th, 2019. E, approval of the August 2019 financial statements for the Village of Salado, Texas. F, approval of a resolution authorizing participation 
and the ICMA-RC Deferred Compensation Plan for employees on the village of the village of Salado. I'll entertain a motion, please. Motion to approve, Mr. Mayor. Second. Motion has been made. Seconded. Is there dis are there discussion? Yes, Your Honor. I, uh, the uh, I guess this is directed towards Don, but uh, on Tuesday night we had a meeting here. Did we have a quorum with the uh, alderman? And will there be any minutes also provided on that? Yes, sir, there will be. There will be. There was a quorum present. And that will be at a different at a later date. It's your next meeting. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Those would, be, so you know, those would be very broad minutes, just noting that there was a form of prison. Any other discussion, please? Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed? Likewise. Passes. Don, this is your turn. Okay, Mayor, members of council, I've tried to shorten this report up a little bit since you have a rather hefty agenda. First of all, a regular status report on the wastewater project. Our connection activity has picked up in the last couple of uh, days as we near the deadline of October 1st. We're up to about 47% of the properties that have connected or are in the process of connecting to the wastewater system. Uh, we also mailed out reminder cards to property owners uh, with the initial service area to remind them of the October 1st deadline. Uh, we're exploring right now online payment options for the Salado wastewater customers. Some of our customers have requested that option, so we're looking to see if we can do the help. Uh, wastewater treatment plant will undergo its first inspection from TCQ next week, which will be an interesting event. Uh, and lastly, I want to let you know that the charcoal tank systems to address the periodic odor issue at the Royal Street lift station have arrived, and we expect those to basically be installed at both that lift station and at the Church Street lift station in the next couple of days. Uh, status report on sales tax collections. The September 2019 sales tax check is in. It represents, of course, July 2019 sales. It's our last sales tax check of the year. Uh, it totaled some $37,856. Uh, it pretty much was flat compared to last year. And you think, well, our sales down, actually not. Uh, last year's September check was actually inflated as a result of an auto, or excuse me, an audit adjustment. Um, as a result, uh, we had an even, even keel when you compare the two months. When you break checks down and look at the actual collections uh, versus last year and this year, as far as the September period goes, uh, we actually were up about 11% this, uh, this go around. So, the trend continues to move up as far as sales tax dollars. As I mentioned, this is the last check we uh, received this year. So the fiscal year 2019 period will end as far as sales tax collections go, totaling some $527,000, almost $528,000, up about 14% from last fiscal year. And as far as how it compares to what we had budgeted, we're about 129% of what we had budgeted for sales tax revenue for this fiscal year. So a good year for sales tax in Salado. A uh, staff report on a number of couple of, uh, a couple of other items very quickly. Uh, we held a local <laughs> business meeting uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, literally, we invited every business in town, hand delivered invitations to them to attend what we hope will be the first of a series of meetings, what will become a series of meetings, uh, where business owners get together, they start communicating with each other. Uh, we are giving them updates on key projects, i.e. the Main Street project, other things. Uh, we're promoting networking, we're working with the Chamber of Commerce in this effort. Uh, discussing strategies to strengthen the local business community. The next meeting is scheduled for October the 8th. Uh, we think the first meeting went well. There was a lot of good exchange when people started to be comfortable with each other, and uh, we hope it will become a regular meeting event. Uh, School Resource Officer John Oster has started work. Uh, he is now on the Slato ISD campuses. Uh, he's headquartered out of the high school, but that doesn't keep him from going to the elementary school. He's visiting all of the campuses and will do so on a daily basis. And uh, right now he's in the process of familiarization. Uh, getting to know the staff and getting to know the students, and so far, so good, we understand. So later's National Night Out Against Crime will take place on Tuesday, October the 1st, from 6 to 9 p.m. This year, it's going to be at Johnny's Outback. We encourage everyone to show up. There'll be a live band. Uh, there'll be food, other forms of entertainment. Again, this is basically a community block party that's intended to bring people together in, in an effort to try to promote crime prevention and how to get to know your neighbor and how that works in preventing crime in the community. So everyone's invited to attend. It is a free event. Uh, if you saw the mother, the mother has arrived back on Main Street. I'm talking about the rock saw that was here during the construction process for the wastewater uh, plant. Uh, it is back in town now to help with the installation of uh, the construction as far as the Main Street improvement project goes, specifically the drainage improvement piece of that project. They put about a 10 foot deep rock shelf that they can't seem to find the end of at this stage of the game. We were lucky enough to dodge that when we installed the wastewater system at that particular area. but. Uh, they're now making progress, and I think you're going to see significant progress on the installation of that line uh, with that 
with that large rock saw in place. Groundbreaking for the sanctuary. Uh, as you know, they were talking before about that possibly happening on September the 15th. Uh, we received word from Mr. Selesky that they have some scheduling conflicts they're trying to work through. Uh, they're going to let us know a date, hopefully in the next few days, as to when that next date will be as far as the proposed groundbreaking for the residential development. They indicated it hopefully will be in the next couple of weeks. And work is underway to launch a Village of Salado Facebook page. I want to let you know that. Uh, and we hope to get that launched in the next two to three weeks. So that's what we have at this stage of the game, Mayor. Uh, can you tell me when the Main Street improvement, is this still on target? Is it going to be finished earlier or later? Or? They are still on target. Uh, they, they obviously built some time in there anticipating they were going to hit certain issues. Uh, but they are still on target to be finished by this time next year. Uh, as you know, uh, again, we continue to remind people in early January, Main Street will be blocked at Rock Creek uh, for a period of about 40 days. I think it's going to be less than that, but that's the milestone window they've got. It's an incentive contract as they work to replace the, uh, the uh, culvert structure that's in place at that location. There will be a very well-signed detour around, so both ends of Main Street will remain open. Just that area right at Rock Creek will be closed. John, I get a lot of questions about that. You're not talking about the Green Bridge, Walking Bridge, are you? Absolutely not. We're talking about the ugly culvert that you really can't see much of underneath the asphalt. Got it. Um, any questions you'd like to ask, Don, please? I have one, sir. Um, we talked about the school resource officer. Do you have any specifics on how he's interfacing with the students and the faculty? Right. Uh, he's, he's walking the halls. Uh, he's, he's meeting with teachers. Uh, they are in the process, again, of, of introductions and again some FaceTime, so there's familiarization with it. Uh, he's also in the process of dealing with some issues. We've had a couple of activities that he's had to investigate in, in just the first week. Uh, so he's, he's pretty busy. They've got an office set up for him at the high school. Uh, and eventually, next year, when the new school opens up, he'll have his office in the new junior high school building, uh, which would be good. But he's, he's interfacing, going into classrooms, talking to kids, talking in the halls. Okay, thank you, sir. Sure. Any other discussion or question? Yes, Don, do you have um, any update on the uh, flooded house and chicken trail that there's no activity going on? Absolutely. The, uh, as you know, this is the seven-year building permit that, that has no end. Uh, we made the decision a few weeks back to uh, proceed with court action because they failed to uphold their end of the uh, agreements we had reached to try to get that home completed. We anticipate sending formal notice to them within the next two weeks. Uh, we're pursuing criminal charges. Okay. And I'd like to apologize because I blew it just a few minutes ago. We have a distinguished guest here in the audience, and that is uh, Robert uh, Pyatt. Please stand. And uh, Rebecca is uh, the mom, and uh, didn't make it here tonight. Yes, uh, our son got to pay for our football practice. Okay, but we wanted to welcome you, and uh, thank you for letting us uh, borrow Avery for the next few months. All right. Thank you. Right. Sorry about that. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Okay, the next part of this presentation. Presentation of recommending regarding minimum lot size requirements for future developments within the corporate limits of Salado and its ETJ. The special person is going to be presenting that. Don, would you like to tell the folks who he is? You're, yes, sir, absolutely. Your, uh, your board uh, did another great job of appointing uh, citizens to an advisory board, and that was the minimum lot size task force. Uh, and the chairman of that task force is here tonight to present the recommendations. They held several public meetings and there was some extensive discussion. I'd like to introduce Jay Rich and Jay will present their findings. Well, as just stated, my name is Jay Rich and I would also like to um, list out the names of all the committee members. Uh, Don Krause, Melanie Kirchmeyer, Jim Lassiter, Frank Wallace, and myself. Um, the committee began its work uh, with one of the first steps to define exactly what our mission was. And um, we defined that as, a, a, or we, we did that by researching and, and defining it as researching and making a recommendation for criteria of minimum lot size for developments within the influence of the village. And that's whether they're already inside the village or they plan to annex into the village. The committee was charged with and can only make recommendations. We recognize and encourage the working relationship between the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Board of Aldermen. 
uh, to build upon our recommendations. The committee considered how our recommendations um, would impact the village and we had certain goals. Uh, one was to maintain the village character and two was to provide for healthy growth of the village. Three was to encourage developments to incorporate green space and four was to discourage developments to be a homogenous lot size housing style. We engaged a process as a committee uh, first to define the scope of our mission and then we needed to discuss to get a sense of uh, village character and aesthetics so we all had a common working platform. We obtained data from Bell County for lot sizes within the village. We gathered public input. We met with planning and zoning committee or commission to discuss shared issues and the committee discussed and discussed and discussed the various considerations to refine a usable set of recommendations and we wanted to craft those to best accomplish the consider uh, the primary goals I just listed. The findings of recommendation uh, because this committee found the issues to be complex our recommendation is in two parts. First an average lot size for new developments. This is a mathematical mean. It's a you take the sum of a development's lot sizes and simply divide it by the number of lots. So I'm, I'm getting a nod of agreement from our, our guest here. Well, she's a, a board member. <laughs> she's checking my math. The the first part is is a mathematical mean to determine an average lot size. The second part is to establish an absolute minimum size that any one lot can be within a development. So we have these two these two factors that both come into play. They're going to guide a development. And then we also felt uh, as a committee very strongly that usable green space is just as important as lot size. So we've included that with our recommendations. Our recommendations are that new development plats should have an average lot size that's across the entirety of the development of 14,500 square feet. That's one third of an acre. Second of all, uh, new development should have a minimum lot size of no less than 6,000 square feet. That's approximately one seventh of an acre. And thirdly, new development should have a minimum of at least 5% usable green space. And by the committee's uh, emphasis is on usable. So my closing thoughts are uh, the time given by the committee exceeded all that we expected to provide when we started this process. The committee members' sense of civic duty required discussion, research, considerations of village character, aesthetics, tax base, future growth, and a myriad of other factors. All the committee members worked hard, sacrificing personal time, and I'm proud to report that with the spectrum of opinions, this committee was able to produce a unanimous set of recommendations I've presented to you. Thank you. Very well, Jay. Uh, questions to Jay, please? Do you have questions concerning this or any discussion? Jay, in your um, uh, public hearings or public settings, did you find anybody opposed to y'all's recommendation? Or were your public meetings strictly to collect data? The public meeting um, was to collect public opinion. And it was held before the committee had developed recommendations. We didn't want to develop recommendations without the input. But, but your recommendation is a collection of those meetings. Well, the recommendation is the entirety of the work product of the committee from start to finish. The, the public input sessions, the, the, um, the discussions that we had with PNC, and all of the work that the committee did on its own 
all, all work towards <laughs> developing the recommendations I just gave you. So the recommendations do include the input that we had from the public opinion, but as you can imagine, public opinion varies a lot. So I'm sure there's, there's a sweet spot where they do agree with our recommendations and there's outlying left and right of that that don't. I have a question, sir. Yeah, Jay, um, when, you, when you come up with these three scenarios, the, the, the third acre, the seventh acre, and the 5% green space, did you reach out to development contractors to see if this is like status quo or is this something that, that they're going to be uncomfortable with or is this something that we're creating new? No, we, we looked at um, what other jurisdictions have done. We, looked, we did gather data from developer, uh, at least one developer, um, and uh, we don't feel that the recommendations are too onerous to comply with. Um, I think that what's going to happen is if you want to wade into the details of this, uh, when somebody has a smaller size development, then the number of lots are, may not allow them to carve out streets and turns and still hit exactly the lot size average or, or you know, there may be certain instances where somebody needs to come up with a variance, but that needs to work through the P and Z process with recommendations to the board on what to do with the variance. Thank the, you. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome. Any other questions or discussion? Jay, I was part of your one of your first meetings that you had, and I listened to the questions and you guys struggling on how to do this and how long would it take and all the things that went with that. I'm very impressed with your report. I especially well, like the last part of it where you said all the things that you considered from public opinion to all the things honesty integrity i think you have done a great job and i think as i think our board and i think the people that are here need to express that to you and to the committee members because you worked very hard on this this was controversial and you did very well i'd like to just say well, thank you I would like to direct that to all the committee members. Uh, I'm just I'm just presenting the findings, but all the committee members worked very hard and worked um, with a sincerity and a sense of civic duty uh, for what everyone felt was the best for the village. We we're all part of it. So very thank you. Well. Thank you. Have the uh, other members stand. So we sure, can please. Can we have the other Melanie? members here? I don't know who else is back there. There they come. There are. Thank you. There's four. Well, um, We're going into the ordinances now. Number eight. Discuss and consider approval of an ordinance of the village of Salado adopting the fiscal year 2020 budget, declaring findings of fact, providing an effective date providing a severability clause and providing an open meeting clause. John? Yes, sir, Mayor, I'll very quickly run through the budget. We've had this presentation a couple of times, but uh, just to, to kind of set the stage, uh, as you know, this is the uh, the proposed budget. It starts with the mayor's submission of a proposed budget. And of course, the board's had a couple of meetings to discuss the items and those and, and offer suggestion. Uh, the proposed budget itself uh, comes in at the general fund level, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1.1 million excuse me, $1.3 million as compared to $1.1 million last year, about 19%. Uh, the general fund, of course, funds our general operations in the city. The hotel motel tax fund uh, comes in at about 5% over last year at $222,000. The wastewater fund, that seems out of whack, but I think it's important to understand that the current budget, uh, you know, was basically a limited year budget uh, because we turned on the wastewater treatment plant uh, in mid-year. So uh, you can see the real numbers for a coming year uh, at $209,000. Uh, the interest and sinking fund relates to our debt service requirements. All in all, all of our funds combined, uh, we're looking at uh, about a 16% increase, a $2.5 million budget uh, versus $2.1 million. Let's look specifically at the general fund. The general fund uh, has a number of expenditures laid out, and we've made a couple of adjustments in those that we'll talk about. <clears throat> the, the bottom line has not changed. We just moved some money around. 
uh, it pays a 3.5% pay adjustment for all employees with the exception of the village administrator. Uh, one student resource officer, we've talked about that police officer in our report. Uh, it includes a public restroom trailer, uh, which would be placed downtown. That is not a portable structure that's going to move from different point to different point. Uh, it comes in on wheels and the idea is to plant it at its current location to tie it into the wastewater system so we have a public restroom. Uh, street improvements right now set at about $60,000. Uh, local drainage improvements on $30,000. Tree maintenance about $10,000. Uh, we're proposing to increase the fire department's contract. Uh, we're going to increase that to $10,000 as opposed to $5,000. Uh, and then one additional police vehicle uh, at the cost of $15,000 as a lease purchase. This is how the expenditures break out. You can see public safety representing the lion's share of our budget. And then you move into administration and, and we progress accordingly. Uh, looking at the revenue highlights, a 20% increase in sales tax revenues proposed. We uh, have been a little bit more, uh, we think, realistic uh, as far as our, our projections on sales tax this year. We've tightened the nuts pretty tight in the last few years to the point that we've far exceeded our estimates. Uh, but we think that we've got a pretty good trend moving at this stage of the game to feel comfortable uh, maybe moving that number up a little bit. 6.2% increase in property tax revenue, 17% uh, uh, increase in mixed beverage tax revenue, 17% increase in electric franchise fees. A 33% increase in building permit fees and a 5% increase in municipal court revenues. This is how the revenues break out. You can see tax revenue, of course, making up the lion's share of our funding sources. The hotel motel tax fund budget. It's important to understand that this is a budget that is intended to fund marketing of this community for overnight visitation. Not marketing of the, the business community per se, the retail community, but overnight visitation. Uh, is what this is intended to do. It can incorporate some of the business community as part of the shopping element to come to Salado, but it's intended to try to promote heads and beds. Uh, we see a 4.8% increase in room tax revenues. Uh, we have 3.5% pay adjustment for the director like the other employees. Uh, $23,400 allocated for a part-time visitor center clerk and two weekend trolley drivers. We have $70,000 earmarked for the actual tourism marketing campaign and $21,000 allocated for the Salado Art and Cultural District signage project. This is how the expenditures break out. The wastewater fund budget, uh, $177,000 increase in monthly service fee revenues is what we're anticipating. Uh, $80,000 increase in maintenance and operation costs, uh, $21,000 increase in electric costs, a $10,000 increase in sludge removal costs. Again, these are all going up to meet the true annual cost of an operation up against a six month operation, which we're in right now. Uh, no rate increases proposed for wastewater customers as people are still tying into the system and will be, we assume, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, no general fund operating subsidy is projected. And uh, the FY2020 is the first year, as I mentioned, for operations of the new the Village of Salado wastewater system, the first full fiscal year. And here, as you can see, maintenance and operations. Understand that is basically a treatment plant cost, the area in yellow, uh, at least in the early part. You'll see in the next couple of years, three to five years down the road, uh, you'll start seeing some maintenance costs relating to the actual collection system. But in the first couple of years, it's primarily a treatment plant cost. Interest and sinking fund, a 1.4% increase in property tax revenue, a 2.8% increase uh, in 2015 principal payments, a 4.7% decrease in the 2015 interest payment, a 47% increase in the 2018 issued principal payment, 25% decrease in the 2018 interest payment, a decrease in debt service tax rate is being proposed, and we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. Uh, this is the way it breaks out. You can see how the various accounts roll in. Let's talk about the ad valorem tax rate to help fund this budget. It's not the sole funding source, but it's the large funding source as far as the city's revenue sources go. <clears throat> and what is uh, the, the, the mayor's original submitted budget uh, called for basically uh, going to the rollback rate, and that would be a rate of uh, 0.6135. Uh, the rollback rate is the maximum rate we're allowed to go without having to go to the public for a vote. Uh, and so the, the idea was to take it to this particular rate uh, to generate the funds needed to, to fund the added demands on service in the village. Uh, we've had discussions at the table about the idea of trying to bring down the tax rate, in particular bring down the debt service side of the tax rate. Our tax rate consists of two portions. It consists of the maintenance and operation portion, and it consists of the debt service portion. Uh, the debt service rate is set basically, uh, you know, by the uh, by the the debt that you're that you're encountering, and, and it's intended to fund solely the debt you're encountering. The M and O rate funds the city's maintenance and operations, the general operations fees. Uh, the maintenance and operation rate that was proposed in the mayor's budget, and even with this revised proposal, we're going to talk about uh, the maintenance and operation rate is, is 0.2070. 
which is the rollback rate for the maintenance and operations portion of the tax rate. Uh, the debt service rate was originally proposed in the mayor's budget, again, taking the full tax rate up to the rollback rate uh, at 0 0.4065. The discussions were, let's bring that rate down if there's any way to do that. And, and there are ways to do that. As you know, we have impact fees. And one of the main purposes of that impact fee is to try to use that money to basically bring down uh, the, the debt rate and then to benefit the taxpayers uh, and then to reduce their tax burden. Uh, the original set out, again, at 0 0.4065. Uh, what we're proposing tonight is basically to bring the debt rate down to 0 0.3682, 0 0.3682. And when you combine those two together, you come up with the total property tax rate of 0 0.5752 versus what the original proposed tax rate was of 0.6135. So we're going from the rollback rate to the effective rate. The effective tax rate is that tax rate that generates the same amount of revenue as last year's budget using the current values, current property values. You know, we had a pretty big jump in property values between last year and this year. And as a result, it's kind of made these numbers look awkward, uh, but this is basically the way it is. And that is we're proposing to, to go to the effective tax rate and that's 0.5752. So how do you bring down that debt service rate? The original alternative proposal was to basically uh, do a combination of things. The current proposed general fund budget had an allocation of $30,000 to go towards debt service. And then we would take the remainder to bring that debt rate down. We take the remainder from the impact fee budget, uh, which was about $41,000. Subsequent discussions have said, you know, if, if we could go ahead and use some more impact fee money, of which we have some, uh, and, and, and instead of funding debt service through the general fund, uh, with that $30,000, take another $30,000 out of impact fee dollars and roll that in. So you're putting in about $71,000 in impact fee dollars. So what happens to the 30,000 that you were gonna allocate for debt service in the general fund budget? Well, the idea is that we would move that to streets. Uh, you have some $60,000 budget for streets right now. And what you do is you'd roll that into streets. Uh, so you'd have close to $90,000 set aside for streets. Uh, you know, it's 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 a good idea from a standpoint of, of trying to pour more money into streets. Uh, we also have money available in fund balance for streets uh, that, that you could potentially allocate to depending on the project as we start working on that. So uh, that's kind of what we're looking at at this stage of the game. So that one adjustment is proposed, you know, as far as the $30,000 going to streets. And there were two other alterations that I need to mention. Uh, and, and that is, you know, we decided the increase had another five thousand dollars from the fire department's proposed original five thousand dollar reduction to get it up to that ten thousand dollar mark. Twenty five hundred dollars we're proposing would come out of that uh, streets budget, which should not have a significant impact on it. So you're going to make two thousand dollars less than the number we talked about. And then what we would do is, is, is we would go in and uh, remove that other twenty five hundred dollars uh, from the tree trimming piece and, and take it in that direction. Uh, that, that's kind of what we're looking at. I, I mean, I feel I, I raised the flag in the beginning and I still raised the flag about the fact that we need to be cautious on the effective rate versus rollback. But I think we have the ability to do that with growth we're anticipating. As you know, we're going to be declared a large city in next year's tax modifications, which means the three and a half percent cap is going to go on board with us. Uh, we also have the ability to bank increases and with the added value coming onto the tax rolls, uh, we can be able to bank some of the benefit of that new growth. Uh, and, and not get hit too hard by the three and a half percent cap next year. Uh, we're pretty conservative in our spending practices, and, and I think it's important to understand that. Uh, and, and we will continue to say, yes, we have a budget we adopt, uh, we see a need, but that doesn't mean during the year that we automatically hit the accelerator and spend to that cap. We spend very frugally, even though we've been allocated revenues. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily spend all that money and try not to if at all possible, even though we. We, we just look for other ways to make it happen if there's a way to make that happen. Uh, we try to budget realistically is kind of where I'm going. So that's what we're looking at as far as the budget goes. Uh, and Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you. You have a public hearing on this. And it's up for approval tonight. So that again? You've had a public hearing on yes. that and that's up for approval tonight. Yes. Um, questions to Don. Don, no. will you need a motion on those three changes? Uh, you can. We, you want to adopt the motion if you want to adopt the budget with those changes the motion one motion would accomplish all we will need a record vote on this budget for those who don't understand what a record vote is what is that from that is where every member will be called upon to vote 
yes or no, or I or nay or what's that you want? Okay. So we're still asking now questions. Right? Yes, please. So non one cent um, property tax equates to about nineteen thousand. Thereabouts, yes, sir. Right in that area. Mm -hmm. So once we adopt a point five seven five two. That becomes the floor. I mean, next year you're not you're not going up from five seven five two next year. Well, like there's going to be a new floor. Yep. But <clears throat> and a lot of it hinges on what happens to property values. And as I mentioned at the last meeting, the appraisal district is saying, "Don't hold your breath." Other questions, please. I got a question, sir. Um, the last time the police chief gave his rep up here, I asked him the question, how many officers we have and can we run 24 hour locks? He said we can, but if he loses one officer to vacation or sickness, whatever, that all goes away. Sure. So, and this is a hypothetical question. What if we need another officer during the course of the year? Is there room to squeeze another one out at about $75,000 a year with a car? you're going to hit the budget somewhere to get that money. Unless we certainly would not recommend funding personnel at a fund balance out of your reserves. That's, that's not a good practice. Okay. So you're going to have to look to the general fund and figure out a way to find $71,000 in the budget to make it happen, whatever that cost is. Okay. And the second one, as you, you mentioned, the, the wastewater treatment plant. Yes, sir. Are there any forecasted maintenance costs that you know right now that we're going to take? year. You should be in pretty good shape for the first few years there. What you're going to see, the, the added cost you're going to see in that particular area uh, is going to be mainly in the area of sludge disposal because as more people come on board, the sludge production is going to increase, and, and that that's, that can be a little costly. Uh, but we think we're still going to be a couple of years out before we start seeing the full hit as far as the sludge production goes. Okay, thank you. Sludge production, of course, the byproduct of the treatment process. Other questions, please? It's not, I think this is a, a good budget, and, and I, uh, I appreciate some of the concerns and the comments that we received during our public hearings about uh, lowering it, and I think this is about as low as we can go and still provide adequate services throughout the, the village. My question is, is that we do have risk out there right now. And we've talked about this, and that is a possible lawsuit against the village, and we could possibly lose our, uh, our impact fees. And if that happens, um, what's our backup plan on that? Your backup is to turn the fund balance unless you work out some type of arrangement uh, regarding that litigation if indeed it happens. Translation, if there's some type of settlement agreement that can be reached to, to deal with that. Well, we haven't seen anything yet at this time on a possible lawsuit. Is that correct? No, sir. Other questions, please? I'll entertain a motion. This is on the budget. Is that on the tax rate, but on the budget? Yes, sir, on the budget. I move to adopt the budget with the three recommended changes by city staff. Second. Motion has been made and seconded discussion. Question. The question has been called. Will you call the roll, please? Your answer will be either yes or no. Or the same. Aye. 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 The budget is approved. B. Discuss and consider approval of an ordinance of the village of Salido, Texas, setting a property ad valerium tax rate, approving the ad valerium tax rate, and levy of 0 0.6135 per $100 of assessed valuation of all taxable property within the corporate limits of the village for the 2019 tax year to help fund the fiscal year 2020 operating budget for the village of Salado. Providing for an exemption on residential homesteads 
providing for exceptions for individuals who are disabled or 65 years of age or older, providing for penalties and interest, providing for severability, providing for repealing conflict, providing for proper notice and meeting, providing for engrossment and enrollment, providing for notification to assessor and providing for the publication and effective date. John? Yes, sir. Uh, instead of the 0.6135 weight rate, again, we propose a, a rate of 0.5752 being made up of a MO rate of 0.2070 and a debt service rate of 0.3682. And if we wanted to do a different rate? Absolutely on the table. Whatever. If you may, you'll do it in the form of a, an amendment. We have a we first. have a motion to do discussion, right? Well, yeah, we're in discussion right now. I mean, my, my, I mean, I'm all about lower tax rates. I'm, I'm just thinking that if, if the floor is at point seven, uh, five, seven, five, two, the, I mean, I'm fine with the MNO rate at point two oh seven oh. Um, Don, tell me how this works. If, if we did the point two oh seven oh, but moved the debt tax rate to point three seven eight two. A cent higher to make the total rate 0.5852. It took the additional 19,000 that that extra cent, and we're able to put that to streets. Would that not work because it's coming out of INS? Okay. Right. You're at the cap on them, right? So right. you can't take any of the debt rate over. I'll make a motion that we accept the tax rate of the MO rate of 0 0.2070 and the tax debt tax rate of 0 0.3682 to set the total property tax rate at 0.5752, along with all the other um, items and exemptions that were announced by Mayor Blair. Okay. Second. Well, that's an amendment to the original motion. Is that right, buddy? <laughs> No, no, this is straight up. Okay, straight up. All right, we have a we have a, a motion and we have a second. Now discussion. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Uh, is there any vote? Yeah. Okay, let's do the record vote then. Aye. 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 Pass. Number C. Discuss and consider approval of an ordinance of the village of Salado, Texas. Amending ordinance number 2014.01. The golf court and utility vehicle ordinance providing for findings of fact amendment enforcement, including a criminal fine not to exceed $500 per violation, a repeal or severability, establishing an effective date and imposing penalties. John? Mayor, if I can, before we get into discussion, I'd like to present the ordinance that was drafted that's in your packet. Uh, and it is basically for the direction of the board. We drafted an ordinance to amend the existing golf course ordinance. Uh, the amendment is, is rather simple. It includes a provision that uh, says the village hereby allows the operation of night golf carts and utility vehicles as defined by the Texas Transportation Code on public streets in accordance with state law. There's also one addition that was made into it, and it's whether you want to keep it in there or not. It's, it's your choice. But we mentioned uh, during our discussion uh, in the last meeting, and that is the fact that right now our current ordinance is operating on the basic state standard, and then we're moving to a different platform, a different operating standard. 
and as a result of moving and modifying our existing ordinance, uh, we're obligated to make uh, the addition of requirements uh, relating to certain types of equipment. Uh, specifically, all golf carts and utility vehicles operated on village streets and highways must have the following equipment required by state law. Headlamps, tail lamps, reflectors, parking brake mirrors. You must display a slow moving vehicle emblem in addition to any other equipment required by state law and the license plate is required by the Texas Transportation Code. Again, we added that in there just for clarification. The question has been raised and that is, you know, do we need to have that in there or can we just say those things required by the state? Our city attorney's advice was that uh, it's probably better to call out that specific equipment uh, to provide notice uh, to basically uh, in enhance the enforcement process and also make prosecution violations a little bit easier so people have been noticed of the type of equipment that's needed. But you don't have to have it in there if you don't want it in there. It's your choice. The main thing was the night drive. That was the direction. Okay. Questions, please, John, your turn. <clears throat> when this first came up the other day, the last time we met, I was in favor of just doing the night driving thing. I, I don't think we're doing enough yet. Um, and if I can talk openly about this, is can I do this now? Or do I have to stick specifically to the topic? To the topic. Sure. I don't, I, I honestly, I don't think we're addressing the issue, okay? And, and I might be out of order by talking about it right now, but, but based on what we've done on Tuesday, we, we had a forum and, 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 and other, other, other points of views were expressed. So I guess I'm asking for help here. At, at one point, uh, and in addition to the to the listing of equipment that we need on golf course, at what point can I interject what we really need to do? Uh, when we get to the discussion part of this, and John, I'll let you get a little bit into it right now. We're just supposed to present what pretty much what this is and give any background to it. We've got to get it on the floor in a second. And then we can have discussion about it. Ask a question. Sure. Don, um, as I understand it, we received notice from our attorney um, based on a judgment that we received from uh, DPS. Um, can you go into the specifics of exactly what the law is? I don't think people understand what the law is that we have recently you know, received information back on. So can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, during the in advance of the meeting this week, uh, we were presented with a letter that had been written by DPS, uh, an officer, Cooper DPS, uh, who is apparently part of their specialty team that that is involved in instruction of troopers. And, and I guess they had received an inquiry from somebody about whether driver's license and insurance requirements existed for the operation of golf carts. And the letter from DPS it's looked more like it was written by a lawyer. Uh, took the position that golf cart operators must be licensed drivers and there's a liability insurance requirement, much like for a motor vehicle. Uh, in short, the provision, if you, if you read the letter that, that the letter presented was the fact that uh, it's a motor vehicle and as such, it's a golf cart is a motor vehicle and as such, it's treated like any other motor vehicle and that is there has to be licensed drivers and, and you have to have insurance. We visit with our legal counsel about it, and our legal counsel's position feels that the argument that DPS makes is a valid argument. Uh, the problem is the code is extremely circular, and you have to look in four or five different sections to even to even draw the interpretation. Uh, there are mixed views. I will tell you that I understand somebody sat and talked to two state troopers today and asked them whether it was required or not, and, and they were told no. Uh, Yet the hierarchy say yes. We called above the individual who sent the letter um, to see number one, what authority that individual had to send the letter, and, and, and number two, to see if that was the position of DPS. And, and, and they confirmed that was the position of DPS, and, and their their interpretation is that our lawyer feels that based on his review of their interpretation and his review of the law, that there there probably is a, a requirement for licensed drivers and insurance. Uh, 
think it's a topic for debate, to be very honest with you. I mean, I, normally, it's, it, this is, it, it, you know, there were some changes made in the law. Uh, the law is vague. Uh, it, it is all over the place. It, it is not as simple as saying, you know, you can do this, 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 and have to do this, 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 and that's it. Uh, you find yourself moving around. But the interpretation of, of our order was the fact that they feel that there probably is a requirement. Any more questions, no, please? I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, the uh, section three about the the sum of the fine was that already in the ordinance, yes, or was that added in this part of this? So Ooh. that is already a, an adopted um, fine amount. Okay. So yeah. And so it'd be safe to say that nighttime driving is not a, a a legal piece that would fall underneath the rules of the DPS because if it's treated like any other motor vehicle, then the motor vehicle should be able to be driven at night just the same as it would be if it were a, something else. Yeah, as I mentioned, you're you're on two you have two platforms to operate under. You can operate under the basic state law. The basic state law says that that's what you're going to live under and not have your own ordinance. Daytime only operations. That's what our ordinance is under right now. The change that this board directed us to make was add in night driving, which is what we've done. And as a result of that, we fall to a different platform. And it says when you go to that different platform, you have to have the equipment that's, that's indicated, which clearly is indicated for night nighttime operations. That second platform doesn't say you're not allowed to drive at night. It doesn't say you're, you're allowed to drive at night. It's silent. And as such, our legal counsel feels we have every right to include night driving as a provision in our ordinance. Okay. Since we've done through all this, okay, since we did, the, the, the motion is to... Hold on a second before you do it. I've got three people that want to speak okay, to good. this. Yeah, Don... Uh, um, I'm a sort of a visual kind of guy, and so uh, let's go with a hypothetical situation under our current uh, ordinance. If a 12-year-old gets in a golf cart without his parents' permission and runs a, a stop sign and hits somebody, and he has a broken leg, and then whoever he hit has damage to the vehicle and a broken arm. This is hypothetical. What does the village do in that case? How would that sort of that, op that operation run? Operating under the idea that you have to be a licensed driver, you know, there would there would more than likely be a citation issue. Uh, now, wait a second. Under our current ordinance. Under the current ordinance. Current ordinance. Under the current ordinance, and it happened a day or night. Let's make it night. If it happened in front of a cop car. In front of a cop car. And that's not. In front of the police station. Not on, and not in front of the police, but in front of a cop's guy. Right. right. If, if, if that happened again, I, I say, if the operation that you have to be a licensed driver, he's unlicensed. So there would be a violation there. And with the fact that he operated at night, there'd be another violation there. And if he had insurance, there wouldn't be a violation on the insurance. If he didn't, there would be a violation on the insurance. And more than likely, mom and dad are going to get drawn into All right. You're so, so you're saying that the 12-year-old would get all the tickets? I think the operator of the vehicle would be ticketed in some form or fashion. Would we write a ticket to a 12-year-old? Doubt it. Would we pull mom and dad into the mix? Absolutely, because they're going to get pulled in one way or the other. All right, so let's flash forward another month when we've approved this ordinance, and it just says what's here in front of us, where it has to have reflectors and everything. Same situation, 12-year-old runs a stop sign, hits a car. How is the process going to be different? Does he have the necessary equipment? Yes, let's say he has necessary equipment, and that is lights, turn signals. Then there'd be no violation, there'd be no violation as far as the night because you will allow it but okay. the the insurance and the driver's license issue would still exist uh and he doesn't get cited because he's got the equipment okay. 
I just wanted to see, you know, what, what we're trying to do here and, and, uh, and how it's going to impact. Our My belief would be when I say, are we going to write a 12 year old a ticket? Typically in those situations, do you bring the parents into the mix in that situation? You're going to contact the parents and have them come pick the, stick the vehicle up and pick the driver up. And I, I don't think that the law allows us to write a ticket to the parent for allowing the 12 year old to drive. And my, I'm sorry, Frank, I've got one more question. One of our uh, main uh, drivers of our, uh, of our economic community is the golf course. How is this going to impact the golf course? Are they going to have to have license plates and all the equipment to drive that 100 yards down our public streets in, in between holes, or how is that going to work out? You know, I, I think you've got the ability, you've got some flexibility in the law that, that, that will keep you from running into that problem as far as going across from one tee box to, or green to a tee box, something along those lines, crossing the street. Uh, the license plate requirement, I think they may still have under this new law. There's still states still trying to figure out the license plate and promulgation of the rules relating to license plate. But I, I you know, they, they may still have to have a license plate, but I, I don't think from the standpoint of our ordinance, I don't know that it would necessarily be applicable going from one to the other. I mean, if they're driving along, if they're, if they're literally driving on a street, public street, if they're simply crossing a public street, my, my hunch is you probably got a, you, you probably got a defense in that if, if they're going from one hole to another hole. So we're, we're going to cut them some slack in our ordinance so that they can continue to operate like they are, or you know, how are we going to, how are we going to finalize that? I think, I think you could do that. I think you have the ability to do that, to allow flexibility in those situations. How about a 12 year old steals a golf cart off of the golf course? <laughs> That's humor, I'm sorry. That's humor. We, have three, we have three people who uh, have asked to speak to this. The first one is Courtney Dodge, and I just remind you three minutes and speak to us. You got me? Gotcha. Courtney Dodge, 3060 Hester Way. This conversation has taken a little bit of a different turn from when I uh, initially drafted my comments, but I'll read them anyways. When evidence pre presents itself, we should act. When it doesn't, we shouldn't. The source of our motivation should be facts. Current evidence fails to support the assertion that golf carts operating on public roads pose a risk to personal safety or public well-being. Allow me to counter this assertion. A search of peer-reviewed scientific literature finds only two studies assessing the incidence of golf cart-related injuries in the United States. Both have similar conclusions. Injuries of any kind, that's any kind, related to golf cart usage on public roads occur very infrequently. How infrequently? Such injuries occur at a rate of approximately 0.46 per 100,000 individuals. For reference, this equates to one injury every two years for a population the size of Temple, Belton, and Salado combined. That's one bruise every two years. That's one scraped elbow every two years. By comparison, peer-reviewed and government-based studies estimate non-fatal drownings to occur three times. Inflatable bouncy house injuries are 13 times more frequent with similar injury types, bruises, lacerations, fractures, etc. Horseback riding is 77 times more dangerous. And finally, a 2007 study found trampoline injuries to occur 265 times more frequently than any related to golf cart use on public roads, with injury diagnosis being nearly identical. We're attempting to prevent injuries which are statistically improbable. I know, I know, but what if? By the way, you're 32.8 times more likely to poke your eye out with scissors than you are to injure yourself on a public road in a golf cart. There is no published any proposed safety measures being considered today, yesterday, the day before, have any effect on reducing either the incidence or severity of injury on public roadways. Ordinances similar to the ones that are that are being proposed and discussed over the last couple of weeks do absolutely nothing to reduce injury or to improve safety. Thank you. The second person that wishes to speak is Mr. Thomas Moore.
Thomas Moore, 162 12th Green Lane, Salado. I apologize first for not being at the workshop to understand everyone's concern about this issue, but I look at it in a little different way. You're writing an ordinance. An ordinance is a variation from a state law. So if you're gonna do that, you need to write it with some specificity. I think you're missing the point. It needs to be safety oriented. It needs to talk about the possibility of driving at night. You do need to put in that thing, the things that the state law says because the normal person isn't going to go look for all of those things and they're not gonna know it. I know ignorance of the law is no excuse. However, we are a small community that lives by having golf carts drive on public roads. We have events that are the, the village has, the fireworks display. The amount of golf carts on the road in front of my house that night was tremendous. Courtney, I don't think there were any accidents. There may have been a scrape though, so I think we're at our two year point. Yeah, we're good for two years. But there weren't any accidents. And there were people probably a little bit inebriated driving. So we're real lucky. What we need to focus on is the safety part. And if you're gonna put in an ordinance, then put in an ordinance of things that you want to have that are safety related. That is, having the devices that you need to have. Seat belts, I mean really, now you're making the golf courts put seat belts on their golf carts. You know, green fees are high enough, I don't wanna to have to pay for seat belts on a golf cart. And I don't think putting that cost onto citizens is a smart thing. That's not why you write ordinances. Standards are needed. Standards needs to be enforced. I see there's $500 there is the max. What are those things that I can get a violation for? That's the whole reason you write an ordinance is because you're defining the state law better for your community. That includes, can I drive across the bridge to go to Johnny's on my golf cart? Can I go underneath the Main Street bridge to go to Sonic? Can I do that? I don't know. I really don't know. I'd have to ask a police officer if I could. But if it was in the ordinance, then I'd know. You guys did a task force for the property sizes for Salado proper and the ETJ. Is there a problem with doing a task force for this as well? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mark Weaver. And Mark Weaver, 1327 Walker Circle. Uh, thank you all for your service and your uh, your commitment to what our village is doing. I am appreciative of Mr. Cole's efforts the other evening uh, to gain a better understanding of this issue and all the competing viewpoints. I personally learned a lot of good info, and I hope that other members would consider similar approaches, uh, like was just mentioned, other task forces, when we have complex or contentious issues. I also found there's a lot of confusion on the current state law. Uh, and I would urge you to understand where we are starting from before we consider where we're moving to. Uh, so for example, as Mr. Ferguson was just talking about the DPS letter, uh, I did some research uh, after Tuesday evening's thing. I, I afforded to Mr. Cole, I afforded to the rest of the board. Uh, I found nothing in there about licenses or insurance, and I was checking multiple sections of the transportation code and the new house bill. Uh, so it may be that it's in different sections, uh, but I think there's a lot of confusion out there and we would all be better served to know what the state law is before we figure out how we want to go forward. Uh, in general terms, I, I'm not nearly as eloquent nor have the statistics, uh, but I would ask the board to understand these current laws and then, and only then, enact reasonable ordinances. Uh, I mean, I want you to do night driving. I, I would prefer that and that's something I want. Uh, but that also helps protect the village safety and encourages the responsibility amongst uh, our users throughout the village, but doing so without adding unnecessary, overly restrictive rules that attempts to replace the adult,
personal and parental responsibility that is inherent in what all of we do. For example, in the uh, example brought up about what happens, the result is you can do that scenario with everything, whether they steal a car, whether they steal a golf cart, whether they steal whatever it is, ultimately we are responsible for us and ours. Uh, and it's never easy when you're trying to sue somebody, but ultimately we're responsible. So again, I would ask you to consider, learn what the state law says, inform all of us, uh, get these competing viewpoints because it was very helpful to hear a lot of that stuff, uh, and then figure out a smart way forward uh, without trying to become the parents uh, to all the children in this village. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion, please. Samara, so, I move we adopt the ordinance as presented by city staff. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion? Yes, let me tell you why I'm going down the direction I am. I had a long conversation with Brad Buckley today, who in turn turned around and called Drew Springer, who was the author of 1548 along with Middleton. Both of them told Brad, or not both of them, Drew told Brad that their intent with this bill was not to change anything for golf carts from the previous law. So in 1548, nothing is supposed to change about the operation of golf carts. That was Springer's intention with his bill. Now, that being said, you can read through the bill, and there are so many conflicting items in this bill. It tells you to go here for this information, and that tells you to go someplace else, which sends you back here. There are places where it does say a golf cart is a motor vehicle. But in the 1548, it says it can't be a motor vehicle unless it's reg just trouble, if I want to say it that way. It has to be a registered vehicle in order to be a motor vehicle. Well, you can't register a golf cart. It's prohibited to register a golf cart or register an electric vehicle. You can't register them. They can require a license plate, but 1548 defines a motor vehicle as a registered vehicle. So a golf cart is not a registered vehicle. It's not a motor vehicle, according to 1548. But you look at another place in the law, and it does describe it as a motor vehicle. So until this part gets settled and Springer and DPS and all these people can agree on what the intent of the bill was and the rules can be written, I don't want to see us put that in our ordinance. Now, the part about night driving and the list here, that is very clearly in 1548, and it's, it's spelled out in 1548. The exact verbiage that you see here that city staff has added to this is exactly what's in 1548. So that's why I'm making the motion is this will get us to the point where we can do nighttime driving. And until we get a firm ground on whether you have to be a licensed driver or not, the other thing we have is as a general law city, we cannot exceed state law requirements. So we can't set a higher standard on this provision that 1548 does as a general law city. If we were home rule, yes, we can make all kinds of rules for that. But as a general law, we cannot exceed what state law offers us. So that's why I'm making the motion I am to allow the night driving, get our ordinance in, in line with that, allow that, so we're at least operating legally at this point. Until we can figure out what the licensed driver requirement is, the liability insurance is, until that's settled out at the state level, the AG's office, wherever that is, I don't think we have any business going down that path. Okay, other discussion, please? I, I have something. So, so we're willing to sit here and say, that we can create a worse situation by driving at night, but don't do any movement forward to make it safer. It amazes me. We don't have the legal ability to but, exceed but, but, state but law, John. Okay, but we don't also don't have the requirement to let drive at night either. We don't have to. You can vote against it. I'd like that, to make an amendment to this, uh, uh, to your motion, Frank. I'd like to strike D in its entirety because uh, that was not the intent of the original motion that we directed the city administrator to perform. It was strictly to add night driving. I don't accept the amendment because in the law, this is specifically talks about this. And this, what I asked for was to come up with an ordinance that would allow night driving. This clarifies what you have to have to drive at night. I think it needs to be in the ordinance. Okay. And Further, my, my argument here is that we have, I understand what you're saying about us not being able to go above and beyond the law, but we have conflicting laws. So you're just choosing to, to choose 
the the lesser of the two laws when we have a legal opinion from dps and from our own attorney that says it probably should require the 16 year old licensed driver with liability insurance so we still are making that decision in house instead of simply saying that we follow state law and let the attorneys figure it out you are correct that's basically what the ordinance is saying now is that we're going to follow state law and if state law comes down and says it requires driver's license we'll have to go to that route so it depends on who pulls the card over as to if they're going to write them a ticket or not. That's what it falls down to. And so we're giving our officers in our community no direction at all as to can it be a 16-year-old or can it not. So if there's a DPS trooper sitting on Main Street, they're going to get a ticket if they're 14 or 15 years old. But if they're not sitting on, if it's not them and it's our cops and our cops can make a different decision, like we're not telling anybody what to do. We're just making it more confusing because people are either going to get a ticket or they're not depending on who's writing the ticket. In which law you're following at the time. I'd like to make another amendment, please. I'd like to, uh, in the in paragraph D, where it says parking brake mirrors and must display a slow moving vehicle emblem, I'd like to put a period there and strike the in addition to any other equipment required by state law and a license plate is required by the Texas State Transportation Code. And Don is shaking his head in agreement over there. It's not a problem with that. Yeah, the only problem I have with that is the law does require a license plate now to operate on a street. Well, if you go up and you look at the previous paragraph and see, it says, as defined by the Texas Transportation Code, public streets and all that. So you can put that up under there and not have it to uh, That's true. Go, go through the rational. It it it. I accept that amendment. Okay. All right, we have an amendment on the floor. So which one are we going by? Texas Transportation Code? Yeah, what, you're, what, what basically you're going to do, the, the, the amendment is to strike it, basically, at, at, uh, in addition to any other equipment, and just leave it as an equipment designation. And up, what he's saying basically is the, the item C covers that as a generic kind of cover-all statement of saying any other provision in the Texas Transportation Code. Agree. Then again, there are a lot of citizens out here that don't know that's required. And when they get pulled over and they get a ticket for it, they're going to be, well, nobody told me. Well, at least they could have seen it in the ordinance, and Tim could have put it in the newspaper that it's in the ordinance, so people know it exists. We we are we are crippling ourselves by not being informative and telling the people what they have to do. Let me let me suggest something. I got one more question. Go ahead, uh, Don. How many tickets have we uh, given to uh, golf carts in the last three years? None yet. But That's me, fine, me... but can they? Do they have the ability to do so? Yeah. Let, let me let me let me say something. And that is the interpretation of, of legal and DPS is that you have to be a licensed driver. A, a peace officer is a licensed peace officer by the state of Texas who is tasked and committed and obligated to enforce the laws of the state of Texas. And if it's the interpretation that there's a their driver's license requirement, that officer is going to enforce that, whether he's DPS or whether it's us, from that standpoint. I think critically important to whatever you all come up with and whatever you include in this is there needs to be some type of grace period in the implementation of this ordinance to the point that we can literally send a postcard notice out to every household in this town and advise them of the rules of the game at this stage of the game. You don't necessarily have to put the license plate requirement in the ordinance, but you can put that on that postcard to let them know that that is a new state law and that you'll need to contact the county to get that. I will tell you right now, they don't know how they're going to do that, but they're waiting for the state. But point being, I think you're going to have to go through an educational effort on this equipment piece. I think that's a big issue. And I don't think you're going to see us out there, even the day that it goes into effect, out there ticking in the world. Keep in mind, there's one officer on the street who's probably not there all the time when, when they see him. And, and when he does see him initially, my hunch is there'll be a warning. There'll be a little bit of a grace period that's going to be allowed because people are going to have to get used to this. And, and there's also a process of retrofitting some of those carts, uh, you know, that, that they're going to have to go through. So, and, and that's not, a, and I think it's important to point out this, that is not a city requirement per se. That is a state requirement that they have to have that equipment. We're simply complying with the state in that sense. So we're not placing that burden on them. The state has placed that on them and that cost them. Can I call a question on the amendment? You sure do, Mike. You want to say what the amendment is? 
uh, the amendment is in paragraph D after the vehicle emblem in the next to the last or in the last sentence, you add a period and then you strike in addition to any other equipment required by state law and a license plate as required by the Texas Transportation Code section 551.401. Question has been called on that. All in favor, raise your hand, Did please. You get a second to that amendment. I didn't hear anybody uh, second to that amendment. Yeah, I accepted it. Did you? Yes, you did. Yeah. I accepted it. I accepted the amendment. That's a second. <laughs> All in favor, raise your hand, please. All opposed, raise your hand, please. The amendment passes. Now then, Frank, your motion is. The motion is now to ex to accept the ordinance as presented by city staff with the amendment to drop in addition to any other equipment required by state law and a license plate is required by the Texas Transportation Code section 551.401 from letter D. So I have a question. <clears throat> now that we're going through this, but we're not adding any other amendments because we had talked a little bit about the golf course a second ago. Because they're going to be on village streets, and even though they may or may not be operated during nighttime hours, now every vehicle in the village, regardless of whether they choose to operate during those hours, must comply and have this equipment, correct? It was on the public street. So, but understand this. I, I truly believe in response to Alderman Coggins' question about going from tea holder, tea holder, you know, or tea, tea box to, to green. I'm there's, talking gonna about, an, there's gonna be an officer discretion issue in that situation. We're not gonna be writing tickets to people going from one hole to the other hole. But if they're driving home or driving around town on a golf cart like a normal street operation. I'm talking about the course owned golf carts. Mm -hmm. Are they gonna have to be retrofitted with all of this additional equipment? Unless they're specifically exempted in this ordinance. Only if they're gonna be operated on the city streets. They're always gonna be on the city street. They have to be. But I think not. But what we're saying is regardless, you still have to have the equipment, correct? Absolutely what you're saying. It's not just an at night thing. It's not just an at night thing. You're operating them at all in this village now because of this ordinance, every golf cart has to have this equipment. Well, because of state law. Because Yes, because of the state law, but because we're allowing nighttime driving. So because we're authorizing nighttime driving, whether or not you choose to operate your cart at night, it still has to have this on village trees at any time. Again, my position would be if you want to include language in there that deals with those going from one hole of the golf course, one piece of golf course property to the other, you could potentially do that if you wanted to do that. If not, it's going to be a reliance on officer discretion. And I, again, I think the officers are going to recognize that issue when they, when they come up on it. I agree too, but I mean. And I know times change and people change. So right. yeah, that, that's an issue. So, uh, but I think it's a, it's a valid point. I second Mr. Coachman's motion. Discussion? You guys are doing a disservice to this village. I really do. Because you're not, you're, you're expressly exempt, not putting things in this ordinance to keep people in the dark. And that's wrong. If we're going to follow the law, put the law in the ordinance. If you're not going to follow the law or it's officer discretion or whatever, and you want it to be hazy, then just do away with ordinance altogether and let state law just be state law and do away with the ordinance. Don't have an ordinance. And then let the police decide what they're going to do with it just based on state law and not based on an ordinance. Don, are there new rulings we're getting based on this new law or is it based on the old law? And again, I'm telling you that the legislative intent was not to change anything for golf carts. This is from the author of the bill. So I'm assuming that somewhere down the line in the next few months that this is all going to get ironed out and it's not going to be a requirement. I think DPS's, so. DPS's interpretation is the fact that the new law didn't impact the requirement for license or Their interpretation is it's been that way. And it again goes back to that definition of motor vehicle and circular connection. And again, 1548 clearly spells that a golf cart is not a motor vehicle. None so again, until this is until this gets settled out, 
I don't think we need to go there. Let's just take care of what we have in front of us in terms of night driving because we're allowing that practice now. Let's fix that so it is legal. And let's down the line, if we need to come in, if you want clarification on it, if the ruling does come down that it needs to be a licensed driver, we can certainly add that. It doesn't lock it in today. I'm just saying we don't know that for sure right now. Except for the fact that we have a letter from our attorney stating such. The, the issue the issue is we've got an obligation to enforce what is, what is determined to be state law. Exactly. So. But people want to follow the law, let them fall, like, put the law in there or do away with it. But you can't pick and choose what you're going to put in the ordinance just to meet, you know, the whims of grandparents letting their kids ride in their laps. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. I saw that. <laughs> Don't count the mask. Passes. We almost had her. We almost had her. <laughs> <laughs> it was a quick trigger. <laughs> you know, with Frank, it's not the end all be all. It, it, I mean, we're done with discussion. <laughs> Just do something fun, Don. What's next? You got it. Don, um, watch this really carefully. And if we see any changes, let us know, will you? Yeah, and I understand. We're going to send, we'll send an education card out to people. And we need to do that before we start dealing Number discussion, number six, discussion and possible action. Discuss and consider possible action authorizing the village administrator to proceed with the process of connecting the municipal building and police department headquarters to the Slido wastewater system and to amend the fiscal year 2019 operating budget in the amount of $22,500 to fund the related cost. Yes, sir, it's rather straightforward. Uh, we're ready to connect to the wastewater system uh, as we're obligated to do just exactly what every property owner in the service area is obligated to do. Uh, the total cost estimate we received to connect the uh, PD building and the municipal building is $15,000 and then we're obligated also to pay impact fees and our cost of the impact fees is $7,500 uh, for a total cost of $22,000. Uh, we've stated in there our, our contractor that we're looking at is, uh, is Heidenheimer or actually a mold and plumbing out of Heidenheimer, Texas and our staff recommendation is to allow us to pursue. Questions to Don? And amending the budget accordingly. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to accept. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion? Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise. <laughs> Passes. B. Discuss and consider possible action approving the amended fiscal. 2019 operating budget for the village of Salado. Don? Yes, sir. This was circulated uh, to you uh, by email, and also you've got copies in front of you. This is kind of a housekeeping matter where we go in and basically uh, account for the various adjustments that we encountered during the year. Uh, it reflects the budget amendments you all also made during the year uh, and any adjustments we've seen as far as revenue and expenses. Uh, staff recommends approval. Questions, please, to Don. So you know the projected, uh, the projected of the amended budget shows that we're going to end up uh, with basically a surplus of uh, a little over one hundred and sixty thousand okay. dollars. Don, is this the latest item in this budget? Do we need to add it to it? It's in there. Thank you. Other questions to Don, please. I'll entertain a motion. Oh, Frank, go ahead. Your, your comment was included in there. Just make sure it was in there. Oh, you want to add? Okay. I thought you said it was in there. So. Oh, that's understood. 
move to approve the fiscal year 2019 operating budget with the addition of the $22,500 expenditure to connect the police building and municipal building to the wastewater system. Second. Motion has been made and second. Discussion, please. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise, passes. Number C, discuss and consider possible action authorizing the village administrator to enter into an agreement with a professional lightning contractor to work on the two gateway signs located on Interstate 35 within the corporate limits of the village of Salado and to amend the fiscal year 2019 operating budget to reflect the cost for such work. Yes, sir, Mayor, members of the board, as you know, this is a, a item that uh, Alderman Coggan and I have been working on for some time. Uh, uh, we, uh, as you know, have, have a desire, a strong desire as this community does to light those gateway signs. Uh, we have basically looked into the, the needs and looked into what was going to be needed to light those signs. And uh, we've had contractors examine those uh, and tell us you know, pluses and minuses as far as what's there, how long it could last, those type of things. As we pointed out, what was discovered in the examination is that uh, uh, a significant amount of the material that was installed on those signs uh, was actually interior lighting uh, products as opposed to exterior lighting product, which means it's 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 long term, its lifespan you know may not be uh, real long. It, it's fine as it is right now, maybe fine for a couple of years, but uh, what we're proposing tonight is just to get these signs lighted, and then we'll continue to monitor. And if at some point in the future we see that we start having problems, just know that there may be a need at some point to go in and actually put in uh, exterior lighting, exterior rated lighting uh, to, to make it work from that standpoint. With that said, uh, we, we've examined several ways to light these, these uh, signs, and uh, we have uh, some proposals in that, that we're very comfortable with, uh, with some new controllers uh, and, and with some new solar arrays uh, and, and with an installer. Uh, we think that we're going to be able to do both of the lights, both of the, the, the signs for a total package, not to exceed $15,000, which I think is a pretty good price based on some of the early estimates that we got uh, when we were looking at that. That said, uh, we received a call this morning from Merle Skalka, who Merle has been gracious and a, a huge advocate in this community for this project. And uh, he, as you know, was, was integrally involved, and, and he has... Uh, some comments he'd like to offer to maybe show some support for what we're fixing in counter. The proposal at this stage of the game is, is to look at using city funds uh, to, to fund this and not, not to exceed 15000 But Merle, I think, would like to talk to you about uh, something he'd like to propose to you tonight. Merle? Thank you. Good evening, Merle. Sir? Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Glad you, Appreciate it. You glad you got all dressed up for this. Thank you, thank you. I just, just got off my golf cart. So. Is it lighting? It is lit. No turn signals, though. It's the old-fashioned left and right. It doesn't okay. say turn signals, it just says lights. Thank you for the consideration on this. Uh, I came to you probably a year to 18 months ago requesting some financial participation. You were gracious enough to do that with the added responsibility that myself and the committee have additional donations. We receive those donations. Uh, we uh, had an engineer that was supposed to have the knowledge to do this. It's the old fashioned or the Texas saying that uh, somebody put muck on your boots and told you as a rainstorm. Well, as you well know, that has not turned out as well as first anticipated. However, the good news is that uh, we still have $6,425 that we would like to give to the give to the city when the contract is, is everything is completed and Don gives us the okay. We'd like to give that money to the city to complete this project. Any questions? Any questions to Merle? Thank you, Merle. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mayor, again, we anticipate that we're seeking authorization 
that perceived and an amount not to exceed fifteen thousand dollars, we think will actually come in under that mark uh, based on what we're looking at. So what you're what you're looking for is about eight thousand dollars in reality. Uh, realistically, yeah, but I, I think we need to we need to seek authorization to, to proceed to for the full yeah. not to exceed fifteen thousand okay. and allow us to contract and get the work done and then we'll contract Merle and the model gives us this share will be responsible for the rest. Okay. Any questions please to Don? Don, last time we talked about this, we wanted to make sure there was nothing anybody could do to put a lien on this project or anything else. Are we comfortable that the project's free and clear right now? Yes. Thank you. Don, when can we get this thing lit? Our hope is to try to get it lit in the next 30 days. It's a scheduling issue with the contractor, but they understand our priority and they want to try to get it done in that time. Other questions, please? I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Motion has been made to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion is made, seconded to approve this. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise. Passes. Merle, thank you very much. It's been a long journey. It, it, uh, well, wow, thank you. The, the citizens that, that participated in conference in getting it done, they're probably going to get it done. Thank the board for that consideration. Thank you, Merle, for working through it. Okay, number D. Discuss and consider possible action regarding a petition to annex 54.029 acres located near the interstate of Royal Street and Smith Bluff Road. Don? Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, members of the board, uh, this is the Rosemont property that uh, you all uh, dealt with concept plan on some time back. As you know, they received a uh, wastewater capacity reservation letter. Uh, in order for them to get wastewater service, they have to come into the village. Uh, and they agreed to petition to come into the village. They've done so. We have the uh, petition in hand, uh, and uh, we're asking you to allow us to initiate the proceedings. Uh, the interesting thing is, is, is in the last law from an annexation standpoint, last legislative session, uh, there were some minor changes that impact general law cities. Uh, the great thing about it is it only requires us to have one public hearing now since it's an individual property owner petitioning, and there's not some type of public vote uh, that, that the other cities are encountering at this stage. So uh, what we've got is a, a timeline that, that's scheduled out that basically calls for us to go through the proper notifications uh, and, and to have a public hearing uh, and then go through the adoption of the ordinance. So we anticipate uh, the final annexation ordinance uh, being filed with the county clerk sometime in, in mid-November. We've tried to put this schedule together to try to keep out of Thanksgiving holidays uh, and try to get out of the holiday period in general. Uh, your, your public hearing would be on 10-24 with adoption of the ordinance to follow. So, Staff is uh, recommending you allow us to proceed with the annexation timeline and begin the notification process and the formal process as required by law. Questions to Don, please. Has the developer been notified that if we we real, he realized that we want to take that that land in, but we've had nothing but problems with the other area, so he's kind of on a you know a little bit of a short leash. He is on a yes. Right. I just want to take that land in and then us, you know, be stuck with another one of those. No. It was, it's actually their request to annex and it's in their right in their petition. John, is the developer in Texas? Uh, the developer is not in Texas at this stage of the game. His partner is taking the lead on this annexation process. Any other questions, please? The firm that's, the firm that's doing this is called Great Land Development LLC is what it's called. Say that again, please. Great Land Development LLC. Okay. Don, do you see anything that's wrong with this? Anything that causes us a problem? No, sir. Good. Okay, I'll entertain a motion, please. I move to approve the annexation as presented. 
Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion, please. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. Passes. Number E, discuss and consider action renewing the Village of Salado's insurance agreement with Texas Municipal League Health to provide employee insurance benefits. Yes, sir, this is another housekeeping matter as we started the fiscal year. We're recommending renewal of our health insurance program with the Texas Municipal League Health, better known as IEDP. Uh, there is an increase in, in the base rate that we're going to experience in this coming year, which we anticipated. Uh, that's just for basic health coverage, no increase in the cost of dental and vision coverage. Uh, as you know, the village funds the insurance cost of full time employees, while each employee is responsible for the cost of insurance coverage for their spouses, children, or family uh, if coverage is needed. So, staff's recommendation is to allow us to proceed with renewal. Don, I assume that the staff, by, if it's their own, um... If it's their understanding and they like that, I assume that they do like it. You did not have problems with this this year? We do not have any issue at all. It's a pool, so you get a lot of benefits. The benefit of this over a Scott and White program is uh, you, Scott and White, when you get out of their service area, has a, little, has a few more restrictions than this policy does. This is United Healthcare, and so uh, you have equal coverage regardless of where you're at. Questions to Don, please? I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion has been, is to approve this. There's been a second to it. Now discussion. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise. Passes. Number F. Discussion and consider possible action amending the Village of Salado governance policy. Don? Yes, sir. As you know, back in May of 2018, the board adopted a governance policy, which basically is a, a guiding document for the board and how it handles its discussions, its procedures, its actions. Uh, it's not a regulatory document. It's always subject to change. It's a policy document is really what it comes down to. Um, that said, uh, there are several provisions in this particular policy that's adopted back in May that uh, place restrictions on how you could deal with the public and how the public could deal with you as far as their comments go. Uh, you know, translation, uh, the, the previous policy had restrictions on the ability of board members to accuse others and to badmouth others, as well as the public from doing the same to board members and be accusatory and make comments. Well, as we talked to you about uh, in the last meeting about legislative changes, uh, the, the legislature, believe it or not, adopted a policy in this last session that said that you could no longer badmouth and stand up and be accusatory and, and make derogatory comments, you know, in a public meeting. Uh, you can, you can no longer prohibit somebody from doing that. Before, there was not a restriction on it. Now they're saying you can't prohibit somebody from standing up and doing that. It applies to you, it applies to them. So there's a need to go back in and modify this policy uh, to basically allow uh, those type of comments if necessary doesn't mean you can come in and create a riot uh, what it means is you have freedom of speech and, and and that's that's what it's meant it also sets in that legislation that was approved a requirement that the public must be allowed to speak on any item on a public agenda you cannot restrict that public comment whether it be a public hearing or not a public hearing the public has the opportunity and the right to speak on any item and so we have to allow them to do that we had a policy that uh that, that indirectly said that but we've made the changes to be very clear about the fact that you have that ability to speak in, in that sense uh, there also is a, a requirement in there relating to if you're speaking through a translator uh, you're still allowed as you know to, to establish time frames for how much you can speak time limits for how much you can speak uh, if you're speaking through a translator the new law says you have to be given twice the amount of time as somebody who's not speaking through a translator uh, and it's recognizing the fact that obviously that's a little bit more of a challenging task so with that said, we've made the adjustments to the government policy to bring it in accordance with the, the new state law and staff recommends approval. Don, I have a question concerning that. Yes, uh, people can speak on any item on here. Do they, does that mean we do away with comments and we open the floor? No, sir, the, the comments, the, the citizen, the, it doesn't change that at all okay. because the citizens comment section relates to items that are not on the agenda, but the items that are on the agenda if somebody stands up and wants to speak, you have to let them speak. 
They have to live by your decorum rules, which means they can't get up there and get disruptive from that standpoint and, and, and do the riot deal. But uh, you have to let them speak, whether it's a public hearing or not. Then let me ask this, Don. Do I do as I do here uh, to the people that are sitting out there? Is there anyone want to speak to this? Yeah, they have the right to come in and register to speak, or you also should also ask on items, is there anybody else who would like to speak? Just to cover somebody who may not have submitted a note. Okay. Because there may be some who are uncomfortable submitting a note. Okay. I'll entertain a motion, please. Motion to approve. Yes, sir, second. Second. Must have been made and seconded. Now discussion. Don, the problematic area on this one is uh, having to have a translator come in. Yes, sir. So if uh, we have somebody from Norway that wants to speak, we have to find a Norwegian translator to come in? At our cost. So the, the, the times that people can get up and speak, is it during the discussion phase or is it before? before. I guess I'm a little bit confused on when they can talk. It, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a procedural issue. Boards and councils deal with that in a different manner. Some ask for comments before they let the board members talk and there's any type of vote consideration. Others wait until there's a motion that's been proposed and then they allow the public to speak after the board or before the board speaks. Uh, so it really is, is, is your your preference of how you run your meetings. You just need to give them the opportunity to speak on an item if they so wish. Do you still keep it to three minutes? Yes, sir. You have the right to regulate the time, and you have the right to regulate decorum, but understand your regulations of decorum cannot tell somebody they can't be negative, derogatory, abusive. Okay. Any other questions, please? Entertain a motion, please. Well, we've got it. Discussion's taken place. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. Passes. John, this is a lot of stuff on this thing. Did you know that? Workshop. Discuss and consider issues relating to the possible implementation of a heavy truck permit program for the village of Salado, Texas. And that's me. <coughs> Folks, board, this has concerned me greatly for a number of years. First thing is, if you go down Chisholm Trail, about where the beautiful waterfall is there and the road takes an S turn. You can't hardly get two big pickups down through there without one of them stopping. And if one has these big mirrors on it, you're probably going to get one of them. That's not the issue. If you have trouble with that, what are you going to do with an 18 wheel? What are you going to do with people that are walking? or golf carting. It's hard to come up with a solution for this. One of them might be, we can shut our roads down unless you're building a home in the city limits of Soleil. And if that's the case, then all you have to do is just get a permit with the address on Or we could make road routes for big trucks through Salado. Or we could do nothing and say, work it out yourself. I'm telling you that when we are elected to our position, we've heard it all night long. We are responsible for the health and welfare of this village. And I will say to you, that is a great concern to me 
as a tax paying person of this village and as a mayor also. That's where I am. This is workshop. There will be no, uh, we're just getting it on the table is what we're doing. There's going to be no motion. There's going to be no action. I just would like to hear what <clears throat> the Board of Aldermen says. I got a question, Mr. Mayor. I'm all in favor of this. I, I like where you're going with this. What is considered a heavy truck? 18 wheeler, garbage truck, school bus, delivery truck? Well, I, it, it is certainly not a school bus. That, that's understood. I would think that it would be <clears throat> an 18 wheeler, a concrete okay. uh, truck, something in that, in that range size. That's something we would have to work out. We just need something to work on so that we can get there. I kind of like the idea of a specific truck route, but as long as that doesn't, but the, I think what would come with that is if a truck route, you'd have to have reinforced roads. You'd have to have roads other than chip seal because they'll wear out so quickly. So that may be something to think about. I think that is something to think about because when we repair those roads, you ever try to repair roads on a $1.3 million budget? That's a lot. Because I think if you, if you maybe make a permit required for to bring a heavy truck in, I think you may deter development of the city. Okay. Can I ask a question? And that is, how do you deal with the situation if you establish a truck route uh, how do you deal with the situation where I'm building my house and I'm not on the truck route and that truck needs to get to my house? You know, typically truck routes are intended to route vehicles around a high traffic area and those type of things. Uh, I hear what you're saying on the permit, but I think the permit idea makes better sense to the point that you somehow roll things into the building permit process where you start establishing requirements for deliveries and trying to identify routes for deliveries and try to communicate in the beginning with people because i think a truck route it may be great to say you're going down the street but what happens if you don't live on that street and you need to get a concrete truck before your driveway or before your pool and those type of things just an idea i suppose i don't know it's a tough one how do you control the permit process you see through the building initial building, building permit. permit? They're obligated to get a building permit if it's construction, which I think seems to be the main issue that we hear complaints about is, is the heavy truck traffic, concrete trucks or lumber trucks and those type of things. It's not as much the the uh, FedEx trucks we get complaints on and those type of things as much as it's the, the heavy construction type vehicles. I think you, you draw them in during the permit process and then you almost establish for lack of a better phrase, a routing process. Yeah, is it a little cumbersome? It can be cumbersome. Uh, it'll take a while for some of the people to get used to, but once they get used to it, maybe they get there. It's a big problem. Okay, this makes my brain hurt. Because we just talked like a few items ago about not being restrictive and following just a bare minimum state law. Don't go anywhere above and beyond what we're already have to do and all that stuff and then in a few items down we're like but we want to charge all the trucks to come into town what about moving vans what about people moving to town that's a really nice way to welcome them here is hey by the way you're going to pay a $50 fee to get your truck down the roads because we have some low right low hanging lines that the utility company should be handling and I understand that like some of our roads are narrow but it's kind of what makes Salado Salado is having narrow streets and we just know those of us who have lived here forever that you got to stop the bottom of that little curvy S hill whenever you see somebody coming the other direction. If you don't, well, you just better figure out how to back down it. I don't know that. I, I would not recommend if you do a permit or something like that, I would not recommend a fee. I'd make that part of the building permit, and, and that's just part of the process from that standpoint. But I, because I, I don't know that we want, that's cumbersome, number one, from a collection standpoint. You're already going to be dealing with it to communicate. And it's going to be a challenge to communicate. I can guarantee you that because Mike's the dispatcher, you know, for Avery. 
But Avery's in a rush, and she's got to get three other places today, and she's going to take the quickest way to get to point B. And it may not be point D to get to B. I mean, it makes sense in like in my head, but I just don't know how you apply it on paper, and I don't know how you apply this, but not something else. It's just, it's just radical. Well, I think the other obstacle that you face is that, for instance, Hester Way is only about 25% city. city. The rest of it is county. So what do you do? Let them go all the way down to the 25%? So sorry, you can't go any further. Okay. Same thing with Lowry Street. You see Lowry. I don't know. This is just one that... Uh, Don, how does the... Uh, is, is there any other city about about our size that has something like that that uh... most people just deal with it to be honest with you i mean like i said when you see truck routes typically established they're typically meant to keep heavy trucks out of congested business districts mm -hmm. you know or to route hazmat vehicles around certain areas and those type of things away from waters and those things but as far as neighborhood traffic the only way you see typical regulation of neighborhood traffic is when you have bridges and, and, and those type of things low water crossings and you typically try to weight load those bridges you know, and those type of things, uh, you know, which which in most cases, in most cities, the weight limits are outdated, you know, but um, I have a concern, I will tell you from a city standpoint about when we speak of weight limits, how much longer the single lane bridge, for example, takes too many more dump trucks and too many more overloaded cement trucks, most type of things, you know, that, that's probably worth waiting, but here's the problem you're going to and that is, we, we start banning them on that road right now, which they've been driving on for decades. And so we're going to tell them to go someplace else, which is in your neighborhood or my neighborhood. And it's going to be, wait a minute, you're tearing my streets up. So it, it's, it, it gets to be kind of a game of chase. Uh, but most cities just deal with Mike as far as neighborhood traffic goes. The restrictions normally come into downtown congested areas and on or around business districts and things like that. How do we get the bridges wait? certified or whatever you know what we can do is we can get our engineer to go in and, and do an analysis to, to, to make that determination uh i know. think all this we're across the slater creek in both those locations probably that's a long time coming that main that main creek bridge right there yeah is, is one that's got me uh, yeah we, we've asked that question about the new colton fox are put in and they contend you're not going to have a weight limit issue on that but my comment is what's the weight limit yeah. and what are we going to post it and they need to be signed the kicker is this, we're not, we, our officers are not licensed and white certified. DPS is licensed and white certified. And so, you know, we would call one of them in to do that, you know, or, or we figure out sometime down the road to train one of our guys to be an L and W officer uh, and get scales. But most, most people, when they see the signs and the weight, will know. They don't understand your place. Yeah. And the biggest culprit out there that's damaging our streets are our trash trucks. Yep. I mean, we talked about one trash truck a company versus but what about um a permit from them or some kind of franchise fee or uh you know is there anything like that we could do to uh and, and we have to recognize and i fully recognize that if we charge them a fee all they're going to do is pass it on to the customers <coughs> which is us so i think it's been years since we've addressed the issue of franchise fees i know it I don't know when you address that. I didn't go back to research it, but it hadn't been in recent history. And what you might look at doing is you might look at seeing if you can bump the franchise fees up and then dedicate any increased revenue from the franchise fees into a road fund and start nesting your road fund to, to, to go back towards improvements. I think that's, that's a good idea. It may take a year or two to get you some money, but they pay pretty healthy franchise fees. But you're exactly right. They're probably the biggest culprit as far as the damage. I'd, I'd like to see uh, Don do some research on that and bring back a, a proposal to us. I agree, Mike. I, I, I would really like for us to do some research and see what we can do. Just know yeah. any of those fees are coming right back to us. Well, they are. That's what, <laughs> what I just said. Well, I know you did. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, when, I, when I thought about this, I really wasn't thinking about a permit fee. I was really thinking about you've got to get the permit. But... That's not a bad idea about the roads. It truly is not a bad idea about 
using that money to go into a road. We only have about sixty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars with this budget. That's two two thousand five hundred. Two thousand five hundred. Well, let me see. We might be able to fill three potholes with that. I'm, folks. Let me let me say this to you, please. One point three million dollars to not pay for your policemen. The people who work in this building, roads, anything that breaks, it's a difficult one. And down the line, somewhere, we've got to make some hard decisions. It's not going to be popular. We're not going to do it this year or at least in the beginning of this year, but down the line, there's got to be some hard decisions. Already talking about another policeman. You want safety? That's what you pay for. The people who work in this building, I will tell you, we could never have gotten that sewer in the ground, the, the pipes and everything, if we didn't have the experience of Don. He's led us through it. It's just a difficult situation that we're in. We know there's a $45 million school bond that we're going to all have to put into and whatever else the property taxes are going to go to. Eventually, reality is going to come reality and we have to make a harder decision. Would this help? I don't know. But I certainly agree with what Mike said, Don. Do some... I'll do it. And the other thing you might want to contemplate, and, and we, we mentioned it briefly before, I think in one of our workshops, and that is Salado Plaza Drive is a mess. And, and, and why Salado Plaza Drive is a mess is not because John's driving up and down every day. It's because we've got the delivery trucks parking outside waiting to deliver. When there's an ample parking lot in front for them to deliver on, you know, even during non-business times, and some use it, some don't. But you have the ability to restrict traffic on that street pretty easily. Uh, somebody, I don't know who put up the makeshift no truck sign, but we don't have a city ordinance to anyway. Well, thank you for, uh, thank the board for discussing. Thank the people for taking the time to listen to it. We're going to go to B now. Discuss and consider issues relating to the wastewater service extension policy for future developments in Salado. Mayor, I, I put this on here just to kind of start the discussion with no finality tonight, obviously, but to, to kind of get some just initial thoughts from you guys and we can have further discussion because it was late an hour. But, you know, in the last couple of months, we've talked as we've wrapped up work on the initial phase of the system. Uh, we're, we're talking about expansions to the system and, and about responsibilities for paying for those expansions. And up to this point, your policy has been you're responsible for paying for the extension if you ask for the service. And so the, the question I wanted to pose to you guys is, is that still your desire? You know, or do we want to go back and revisit that policy? You know, obviously in negotiation of development agreements, we have the ability to be flexible in that policy. We talked about that. But do we want to continue to operate with that flexibility in, in, in a development agreement environment? Or do we want to make a wholesale change in the policy to say, hey, we'll, we'll set up a fund to participate, you know, with whatever money we have left over Project. So I pose the question: Stick with the stick with the development agreement approach, or, or what do you think? I, th I think that uh, any other addition that we have on our wastewater treatment lines is pretty much a uh, development. It's going to have to come up with an agreement and, and and be presented, of course, to the board. And it has to make sense and be good for whoever's going to receive services, and, and of course for the village. So I'd be in favor of that. Am I the only one that's got good ideas tonight? <laughs> so let me make sure I understood you correctly. You said we stay the course with what our policy is now. That no, sir. I said let's start treating it like a development and, with, and develop a development agreement. That's, develop our, that's our current policy. And, uh, for any future expansion. All right, so future expansion right now is that if you want services, you pay for that line that goes to you, period. Or there's the option in the development agreement to choose to go that route, but you're wanting to go that route with development agreement on everything. Yeah, what you're saying, as opposed to 
And where do you propose this money comes from? Uh, that's going to have to be part of the development agreement. But even at that, even if somebody came in with one, where would you get the money today to extend the line for somebody? Uh, there are some ideas that you can, um, just like any other development, uh, you can extend some kind of consideration for a tax abatement or some kind of... I get that, but you do that when they spend the money, not when we spend the money. And we don't have the money to spend. That's the issue. I'm just saying that we should, the point is that I want to give the village administrator the authority to go out there and figure out what's a good deal for us and bring it back to us. My feeling is we stay the course. Are, are developers in favor of upfront money to extend the service line before they begin construction? You know, you, uh, the res on the residential side, in most cases, that's the case. The residential side, most of them expect that that requirement to be in place. The commercial side, depend on the size of the community, depends, but, but they're more apt to work out development agreements in that, in that environment, uh, where there's some type of either bid set up or some type of TIF set up, where there's some type of exchange in consideration for uh, and some type of refunding agreements that you go through. But, the residential side, the subdivision developers typically expect to pay for it. So, so if the guy up here buys a lot next to the Holiday Inn, wants to put in a business, okay, we have to run wastewater up that way to his lot. Who pays for that from here to here? On our current policy, they are obligated to pay for that, or they could work out a development agreement with the city and try to come up with some type of cost sharing or something along those lines. But the the base policy is they're responsible for paying for that. And in that situation, if it's one person up there and nobody else wants the service in between, then they're That's responsible for paying the full cost. And then when people start connecting to it in between, they end up getting reimbursed for a portion for each person who comes in. So they get some of their money back. So, so but they that, have to front it. So in, in, in support of, of what Mr. Coachman was saying, who pays for that, they would foot that bill. Absolutely. Before they stick a first shovel on the ground. Or before they get service. Hopefully they're going to be smart enough to put, put, put it in before they put a shovel on the ground. Well, we have other provisions for in our development agreement that don't deal with the West Water Line, that deal with other opportunities to recoup some expenses. But to ask us to pay 400000 to a million dollars yeah. to put in a line for something, where are we going to get that? Exactly. We'd have to go back to the voters, and there's no way that's going to happen. So, so, but we do have some in the economic development chapter 380 agreements. We do have some way for them to recoup money for development. Right. So, uh, on a development agreement, uh, say that, uh, like in John's example, the guy puts in a lock down there. It's going to cost four hundred thousand dollars to put it in. Uh, and he's, he comes in, and that's a whole lot of money for a developer. To to, uh, to put that in. If we could give him some kind of incentive to pay it up front and then he reaps some kind of benefit down the road, something like that might be a, a way that's, to, to make you it. You already have that. That's where you go into the 380 piece and do the DA, the development agreement piece. You also have the ability to go to the state, depending on the size of the development, and potentially get economic development dollars from the state. So we, 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 we get beat up for giving incentives all the time. Okay. I, I think we should have something where this is supposed to cost you up front. There ain't going to be no incentive. If you want to play a game, you play by our rules. Well, you know, we've got, you know, you can't really go through the de development agreement on everybody uh, because, like, we have brochures. They're already in the existing place. We know exactly where they are. That's not a new developer coming in, but that's somebody that we really need to target to uh, figure out a way to get a sewer system to, to brochures. Somehow, that benefits us and it benefits them. How does it benefit us? What is our benefit to them having service? Oh, I, I think you, you benefit from, from a couple of ways. Number one, the environmental aspect of it, you're getting off probably a septic system that needs to be put to bed. But that's number one. Number two, there's obviously a revenue piece for it. Number two, it allows for potential future expansion and development, which is tax based revenue for the village. So I think you could argue that. So, same thing from a standpoint of Salado Plastic. You know, if Plaza had it, 
you could get back into the restaurant business at Saloto Plaza like they used to have uh, and then maybe have larger restaurants. So you've got to look at the, the byproduct of the wastewater allows you the ability to expand and allows you the ability to potentially, you know, eliminate environmental hazards. I agree with you on the environmental hazard side, but I still don't get the, how it benefits us because at the end of the day, it's going to benefit the owner of the building enough. They're going to make enough back to be able to afford putting in the line. You know? As the city will benefit from whatever they make back because there's a percentage they're going to be paying to us both in added value and both in sales tax revenue. So I hear what you're saying, but they're, they're really, you've got to look at the byproduct. It's, a, it's an indirect benefit uh, as opposed to the direct benefit that they enjoy. I just think we have to look at the numbers of each individual development to see if they need a, we need to be able to see like a, a cost analysis, you know, and some sort of cost benefit analysis to where they're going to be able to show us, we're going to invest this much money. We're asking you to invest either, you know, either cash money or, you know, with, with other agreements and um, with offsets. But at the end of the day, we're planning on bringing in X number of dollars a year, which adds, Y numbers to your Absolutely. you know bottom line because if you're just while working with fuzzy math and you don't have any hard numbers that you're holding them to, I can tell you all day long that I'm going to put in a restaurant that's going to bring in fifteen million dollars a year. You never let me tell you something. Your your development agreements. Well, not. You no, know, your development agreements have to be very specific. They're built on specificity to the right. point of, and they're built on milestones and performance measures where they have to repay what incentives they get if they don't meet the particular requirements. So. Correct. What I'm and almost and I'm okay with that, but I don't. I'm not going to do business on fuzzy math because somebody thinks that their business is going to bring in a whole lot more than it does, and we front all the money or take all the tax breaks. You know, give them all that. We don't really get anything in return. And that's all figured out in the development process. What I'm almost hearing is stay the course with the policy, but know the fact that development agreements allow for the flexibility from that policy. Because the development agreement process is going to ferret out the fuzzy map, it's going to ferret out the viability of it, and, and what if, what if any incentive factors need to be built in? In most cases, that's based on future revenue. We're sharing revenue later. We're not fronting money up front, which we don't have. We don't have a bank account to do that. So you do it on the development agreement for that reason. So as coffers come in, we share it back with them. And eventually they recoup a good portion of their not a full amount, but get back a portion of what they invest. Exactly. Just like any other development agreement. That's exactly right. So we'll keep staying the course. One pose pose the question is we've had some discussion in the last couple of months that I want to make darn sure we're all on the same page. Don, that's that's really good discussion though, because eventually we're going to fill up that wastewater treatment plant. Sooner than later. Yes, and we should already be talking about the next one that's going to have to be done or how we're going to handle this because growth is here. It's not something that's coming. It's here. And we've got to also, what will a citizen do if their septic tank fails and Bell County says no? then we've got to have a spot for them to come in. It's a very real issue. Well, you don't have to have a spot for them. They're, all, they're, 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 in, they're in a bind, though, at that stage of the game. We don't have a CCM, so we're not obligated to serve. But at the end of the day, it, it is that is a major quandary because the rules in the septic world change on a regular basis, and they are far, Amber can testify this, they're far different than they were three years ago versus 10 years. And I will tell you that just uh, getting the sewer across the creek was a job that septic tanks was a part of it. How many more septic tanks are you going to allow in Salado, brand new ones, with houses, before it affects the environment of the creek? Okay. Well, that's good. Don, you have certainly put before us a lot of business. Is there anything else that you want that you need correction from? No, sir. Okay. Avery has a, a motion to make. Oh, I know she does. But Avery, I want to ask you, what do you think? Did you write out your letter there that I don't want to do this anymore? <laughs> How do you talk to us about it for a few minutes? It's 
very interesting to see everything that goes on and see everything that actually happens behind the scenes. Because normally when I hear about things, it's probably months after when y'all decide it. So it's cool to see like how it actually happens instead of just some law that shows up. Well, I also want to say to you as well as to the people sitting out there, you have a voice and you represent your generation. And you can speak just like the rest of these guys. The only thing is, you can't vote, but you've got a voice. Okay, I have, are you going to make that motion? Uh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> second. Is there a second? Second. Second's been made. <laughs> Thank you.